Welcome to this virtual edition of In The Yard. Thank you guys for checking out this video. We got a lot of content today, so let's dive right in. The good thing about videos, if there's a particular section or particular verse maybe that speaks to you, I encourage you to go back, re-watch the video, pray through it, and really uh, just seek what God is seeking to speak to you about uh, and really the action that He's calling you to. Um, he always calls us to obedience. Before we dive into the lesson, would you pray with me? Father God, I'm so grateful that we have the advantage of technology to connect virtually. Um, Lord, I thank you for the power of your word. God, that when your word goes out, it always accomplishes it, its purposes. So I pray, God, that as we look at a... Um, secondary resource and then we look at your word god i pray that you would speak to our hearts and speak to our minds educate us inform us um, but above all equip us um, with the knowledge of who you are and the character of who you are god um, just be mighty in this time in jesus name amen all right so for the past few weeks we have been looking at a secondary resource um, to really frame up our discussion in the yard and that is jeff myers the secret battle of ideas about god um, it's a great work um, that i would highly recommend but it helps inform our worldviews not only what the christian worldview says but what five other worldviews say um, and the question we're exploring today is why can't we all just get along? Have you ever had that thought? Maybe you've had personal conflict, conflict within your family, and you look at that and you're like, man, I wish we could get along. What's happening there? Well, the five worldviews we're going to seek to explore shows that they answer it in different ways. So let's look at what they say. The first one is secularism. Secularism says that conflict will cease when we quit worrying about the supernatural and focus on how society disrupts our natural goodness. So again, secularism gives no view to the divine, to the spiritual. I just think here now is all there is. And so that's their answer. Uh, Postmodernism says conflict will cease when we stop pursuing truth. This worldview rejects all meta-narratives or, or larger stories that the world has any meaning. The big stories about why things are the way they are, the meta-narratives. There's no overarching truth that gives meaning to our personal experiences. Conflict is caused by our pretending that our meta-narrative is the true one. Postmodern say there is no truth, um, and they aimlessly wander after um, a personalized truth, and they throw out the idea that there's any worldly conflict is caused by our pretending that our meta narrative is the true one. So that's postmodernism. New spirituality says conflict will cease when we give up our egos and become one with the universe. Conflict comes from big egos, and big egos come from not understanding our true spiritual power. Who am I? And to that question, there's only one answer I am God. So for the new spirituality, they would say hey, there's divinity in you, and you gotta tap into that. Um, that is their answer to why can't we all just get along? It's unrealized spirituality or divinity. Um, new spirituality. Islam. The Quran says conflict will cease when everyone submits to Allah, either willingly or by compulsion. Though most Muslims are peace loving people, the radical beliefs of a tiny yet violent group of jihadists are set are setting the world on edge. Such religious tension seems like the new normal. So is, for Islam, why can't we all get along? We must all submit to Allah. The Marxist worldview, though, incorporates conflict into the very way it encourages people to see the world. So without conflict, you don't have Marxism. Marxism promotes a powerful narrative. We suffer because of the selfishness, arrogance, and insensitivity of the rich. After a century, century of Marxist experimentation, we are further than ever from an answer to the question, why can't we get along? So Marxism is built right. We ask the question, really, in all these worldviews, who is to blame? It's the fault of the religious, it's the fault of the rich, it's the fault of truth seekers, it's the fault of those who refuse to let go of their individual identities, it's the fault of those in rebellion against Allah. Conflict won't cease, these worldviews say, until others change. They're looking outside and they're saying, hey, the problem is out there. This is the Christian worldview. Peace wins, how Jesus offers the elusive harmony we all seek. The declaration, I am meant for community. I can overcome conflict and live at peace with those around me. Shalom as the Christian worldview response to conflict. Four, three insights about shalom as the Christian worldview. Shalom acknowledges the conflict inside us as well as among us. Insight 2, Shalom focuses on giving rather than taking. Insight 3, Shalom focuses on love, not hate. Shalom has been violated. The secret battle of ideas attacks community. All these worldviews breaks down community. They think others are to blame, these external forces, and really does not create harmony for community. But the Christian worldview says Shalom. So we see that, that shalom has been violated. But the good news is, is shalom can be restored. The Christian worldview says Christ's suffering doesn't just bandage things 
up so we can limp through life. It restores fullness and wholeness to life, both now and forever. Because of what Jesus did on the cross and in the resurrection, he's restoring life. He's making all things new. So the worldview of the Christian says that there's hope and that we can have community because Jesus has accomplished the penalty and punishment of sin. Sin's um, strain is no more in Christ. So shalom can be restored. Um, a couple more things about shalom. Uh, four practical things, and then we'll look at the scripture. Three things about shalom. Shalom restores community, brings us in fellowship with God and in fellowship with one another. Shalom shows the newness we had in creation. It shows us the nature that God created us to have, the newness, the, the freshness, the 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 um, restoring us to the image of, of God being a reflection of who God is and what God is like. And the last thing, shalom restores communication. We're not looking to blame people, but we can talk openly. It breaks down those walls of hostility. Shalom, the Christian worldview response to conflict and the question, why can't we all just get along? Four things to do right now who experiences Jesus' peace. And this is how um, Jeff ends the chapter on the Christian worldview of why can't we all just get along. Four things. One, replace anger with patience. See God's image in others. Three, be a peacemaker, not just a peacekeeper. Number four, never lose hope. We are living in a time where um, hope may be falling away, but because of Shalom, the Christian worldview we know that peace is possible and that we have hope. So never lose hope. Now let's look at the scripture. We've looked at the Christian worldview. We've looked at five alternative worldviews. Now I want to look at what the scripture says about why can't we all just get along and really how the Bible compels the follower of Jesus not only to get along, but to be reconciled, to be restored. For believers, we are called to bless those who curse us, to give to those who seek from us. I was sharing this with my daughter uh, yesterday, um, trying to talk about something mean that her brother or her sister did to her, and she has made a profession of faith in Christ. And so um, as I, as her dad, try to disciple her and teach her, the ways of Jesus. I told her, baby, the word tells us, Jesus tells us to bless those who curse us, to do good who do evil to us. So if your brother and sister, they do something that makes you mad or or offends you, like if you are a follower of Jesus and you're being obedient to what Jesus calls you to, he calls you to peace, to, to go that extra mile. Um, and so let's look at what Paul has to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, um, looking at verses 11 through 21. Um, now, the book of 2 Corinthians is written by Paul, who was Saul. He was a man of violence. He was a man of religion. He was a man on a mission. Um, previous to meeting Jesus and being a follower of Jesus, um, it was everything contrary to the Christian faith, much like the worldviews that we just discussed. They don't line up with what a follower of Jesus would say or what the Bible has to say. Um, so they were contrary to, um, Saul was contrary to followers of Jesus. But then after he meets Jesus, he becomes a follower of Jesus. His whole world lines up with what Jesus wants. And he continues his mission with Jesus in the center of his world. And that's what he calls me to, what he calls you to, what he calls all followers of Jesus to, is having Jesus in the center of our life and having a ministry of reconciliation. So let's look at this. 2 Corinthians 
chapter 5, starting in verse 11 to 15. It says, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in the heart. If we are out of our minds, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again so the first step in answering the question why can't we all just get along and really our response to conflict is that love fuels our life we live with God in view um, it says, since we know then what it is to fear the Lord, we have a right view of God. We have a reverent fear for God so that our lives are not lived in what we think is best, but what God, how God wants us to live our life. We understand there is a God in the universe and he has acted to end the violence we face in the man, Jesus Christ. Um, and he really encapsulizes um all of this in verse 14. So we know there's a creator God. That God has acted in the man Jesus Christ. And as we seek to follow Jesus, this is how his love should fuel us and fuel our lives and how we live our lives. Verse 14 again says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. So this love that Christ has is the fuel of the Christian worldview. Love. Not any ordinary love, but the love of Jesus Christ. We live for Jesus because he died for us and we should die to ourselves as he did so we can find this new way of life. I've shared this with our youth. Um, it was our... Uh, Scripture for this year at Mission Arlington, it was Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So as a follower of Jesus, we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for him who died for us. Look at verses 16 through 19. It says, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So, love fuels our lives. The second thing, love reorients our lives. We are now in community with God. We are in community. The cross, the blood of Jesus, makes us right with God. We're in right fellowship. And it gives us a vertical reckoning with one another. Love reorients our life. Look at the last two verses with me, verses 20 and 21. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This is the verse I quoted. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Again, so these are all kind of fit together. If love fuels our life, Love reorients our life. And then the last thing, living in Christ's love is what we're called to. We are being made right with God. It's all about the process. This is my new favorite saying, that it's all about the process. And as we grow in grace, our lives are continuing to know God more love God more, and follow Jesus more faithfully. It's all about the process. It says in the scripture, so that we might become the righteousness of God. 
It's all about the process. We're growing in grace. We're becoming more and more like Jesus. And so just I want to quickly speak a word to those who maybe struggle with their salvation experience. I know there were seasons in my life that I, I doubted my salvation. Am I a Christian? And am I, I following Jesus? There is certainly uh, the voice of the Holy Spirit that will convict us. And so always be sensitive to the conviction of of the Holy Spirit in your life and ask God to reveal to you what it is that he's saying to you. But as far as are you in Christ, are you out of Christ, that, that's a question you have to answer for yourself. And it's really as simple as that. Are you in Christ or are you out of Christ? For me, I was outside of Christ when I was depending upon my own religiousness to make me right with God. I look back and I said, well, I've done this and I've done this. No, it's not about what I've done. But when I became, I knew I was in Christ, it was when I was looking at my life and I said, it's not about what I've done, but it's all about what Christ has done for me. And that's what I'm all in on. That's what I'm banking on. That God has made me right because of Jesus and his sacrifice on the Son. My faith isn't in, hey, I did this or or I prayed this prayer, or I was baptized. Hey, those that baptism was because of the baptism Jesus undertook when he died on the cross and he rose from the dead. And I join in testifying of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in my baptism. It's not my baptism makes me right with God. No, it was a declaration of my faith. And so... Living in Christ's love is all about the process of becoming more and more like Him. And so, if you are wrestling with the season of doubt, settle it. Pray that God lit, w would give you peace and give you purpose knowing that you want to live in the love of Christ. And it's a sweet surrender where you say, God... Here I am. I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve your love, but I pray that you would take my life and use it. That's when you live in the love of Christ. You begin to grow in grace. The Holy Spirit has given us a new way of living, living in his love and seeing the world as he sees it. He is created for his glory. Are you reconciled with God? And so... Jesus has made a way to be reconciled. If you are struggling and you say, I don't know if I'm saved, I, I, I don't know if I'm a Christian, settle it today. Jesus has made a way, and through the Holy Spirit's power, we can live in a new way. This is how we see the world, through the love of Christ. So, as we answer the question, can't we all just get along as we individually submit our lives to God through Jesus Christ, we can have peace. Peace is possible. But I want to end in kind of a, a sombering way. Maybe you don't have peace. Maybe all of this stuff that's happening around just stirs up turmoil in you. Um, and there is no peace outside of Jesus Christ. If there's never been that moment where you've recognized your sinfulness, how you've fallen short of God's glory, if you've never turned or repented of your sins and turned to Jesus for salvation, I want to invite you to do that right now. That you would admit to God that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, but you recognize that Jesus is that way, is that salvation, and you would commit your life to Him. If you would just pray, God, I know I've fallen short. I recognize it. I see it. But I want to live a new life in Christ. Will you save me? Will you cleanse me? Will you give me a new way of living? Living in your love. Amen. Hey, if you've done that and you feel like you need to take that step, I pray you to do it right now. You pray something similar to what I just prayed. Or, um, hey, if you need someone to talk to, um, I'll put up my email address and certainly you can, uh, my telephone number, um, get a hold of me and I'd love to talk to you more about your new life in Christ. The only way to live outside of conflict 
is recognizing there's turmoil within and there's turmoil without. But Jesus has made a way for peace to be possible. I love you guys so much. Um, it's been fun making this video. I'm going to end with a little, kill it, a little clip of an interruption I had um, from Bryson, my son. Um, we love y'all and we miss y'all and we can't wait to be back together. Be blessed. Say hi, Bryson. Hi. Did you interrupt Daddy while he was doing this video? Yeah. What happened to your foot? <laughs> Did you get stickers in your foot? Yeah. Did it hurt? Uh-huh. Do you need to wear shoes? Yeah. Okay, we'll get you some shoes. Can you tell them hi? Hi. Do you miss coming to church and seeing all the people? Yeah. You ready to come back? Okay, say we miss you. I miss you. Say we'll see you soon. I see you, see you soon. God bless you. I, I bless you. Wave, wave bye to him. <laughs>